Turn in your Bibles today, if you will, please, to the book of Joshua. We'll soon be bringing this series to a close, but I want to talk to us about our theme. We've been talking about our theme of Caleb. Caleb said in John, uh, Joshua chapter 14, if you find your places, join us as we stand in reverence of the Word of God. Uh, Caleb said in the 14th chapter of the book of Joshua, uh, a statement that we have used during these few weeks, and uh, if you'll notice with me, 14th chapter, uh, I like uh, what he had to say, and uh, begin in verse 11. It says, and as yet I am as strong this day uh, as uh, they that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war both to go out and to come in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. Now, turn to the second chapter of the book of Joshua. I want to read beginning in verse number 9. Joshua is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and uh, is penned in this book for us. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all of the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my Father's house and give me a true token." Move down to verse 18. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all that and all thy father's household home unto thee. It shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quiet of thine oath, quit of thine oath, which uh, thou hast made us to swear." And she said, according unto your word, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. I want you to notice the last phrase of verse 21. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. Dear Lord, Thank you for these wonderful, wonderful passages of Scripture. Thank you for the wonderful music today that has stirred our hearts afresh and anew. <coughs> I pray now that you <coughs> will crown the mercy seat with your glory. And Lord, may something in this service today make a profound impression an impact upon our life for a closer walk, closer fellowship with you. Pre-adventure, there be someone listening through the Internet, through our radio station, or that will view this service later by television. 
that you will be able to use this to speak to their heart, that the hearts of those that might be lost, and that they might come to know you, our wonderful Lord and Savior, uh, personally and individually. Bless us now, Spirit of God, minister to us. And we we'll thank you for it because we ask in the name of Jesus and for his sake, amen. Thank you. It is very obvious from the time of the departure of the children of Israel from the nation of Egypt into finally the promised land on the other side of the Jordan River, there has been on demonstration and preview the providence of an omnipotent God. Before they fought the battle of Jericho, in the providence of God, they sent two spies out into the city to look the city arrangements over. But more than that, there was a reason again in the providence of God why these two spies went over into the city of Jericho. I want you to hear me well because we learn from this great truth that God is interested in people. More than that, God is interested in us individually. Everybody in this building got saved individually. You might have been in a crowd. You might have been in a camp meeting. You might have been in a revival meeting. You might have been in a church house. But if you got saved, there might have been a group of people around you. But you did not get saved as a group. You got saved as an individual. Which leads us to know, to say, and to understand that God loves the world individually. And God knew in his providence that over across the Jordan, in the city of Jericho, there was a lady or a woman over there who was on the prospect list of being destroyed. But God also knew that this lady was tired of her lifestyle. She was tired of her sin. And she was looking for a Savior. Now of all of the people that lived in Jericho, there was one person over there whose heart had been touched by the God of the universe. And she didn't know how to get to him. She didn't know what it would mean in today's terminology to be saved. But she had a heart that was hungry. She had a desire that was yearning down in her bosom to know the true and the living God. And God in his divine providence, the God of the universe in glory, as he looked out over the city that already was on his list of destruction, he knew there was a lady over there with a horrid lifestyle. She is called in the book of Joshua, and she is called in the Hebrews Hall of Fame in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, and also in the, uh, in the book of uh, James and the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, she is called by the name of a harlot. Here was a lady, a woman in this city who was well known. The Bible is clear that her house was on a wall, just inside the gate. When people would come to the city, her house would be one of the first houses they would encounter. And she was a person known, not only in the city, but across the countryside. She was known as a harlot. She was known for her lifestyle. And yet, as sinful as she was, as depraved as she was, she had a hunger in her heart to know the true and the living God. And up in glory, God, as he surveys the city, looks down into this city, and of all of the inhabitants and all of the recipients of this city, 
He sees that hunger. He sees that desire in that one woman's life to know him. And so when Joshua sends these spies into the city of Jericho, there was much more involved here than looking out over the city. There was much more involved here than planning a strategy for the destruction of the city. The bottom line, the purpose, the apex of the reason they crossed the Jordan, the reason God sent them into that city was because there was a hungry heart over there knowing what she had heard about the marching of Israel all the way from Egypt and knowing that they were coming in her direction uh, and realizing that unless there was a heart reality change in her life, that she would perish among the inhabitants of that city. And she was looking for a living God who could forgive her past and give her hope for the future. And God, knowing that, sent two spies across the river to talk to her, to get her into a right relationship with God himself. What a Savior. What providence God shows us in this great example. I want to tell you something. God works in mysterious ways to get the attention of lost people. We're, we know for sure, the Bible is clear in the book of Peter, that it's not God's will that any perish. Listen, God doesn't want you to go to hell. If you're watching this by television, I want you to know God doesn't want you to go to hell. If you're listening right now through our internet, I want you to understand if you're lost, God doesn't want you to go to hell. If, you, uh, if you're watching this right now through the internet or you're listening to our radio station and you've never been saved, maybe you haven't been to church lately, maybe you're sitting somewhere driving down the road right now, I want you to understand God is more interested in your salvation than you are interested in your salvation. He gave his son for you. And the truth is, if you are lost, you're in the same condemnation as Rahab in the city of Jericho. This city, hear me, this city is marked for destruction. This city will completely and utterly be destroyed in just a few days. Uh, and this lady recognizes that, understands that, and she knows that. And she's looking for an escape route. Uh, and thank God in the providence of God, he sent the spies over there to give her hope for the future, knowing that when the walls are falling and the people are invading the city, she can have shelter in the arms of her God uh, because her God is concerned about her never dying soul. Now that's an encouragement to me to know that. I want you to understand when you come down to the end of your journey, I come down to the end of my journey if the Lord tears his coming. What you do with Jesus Christ while you're living is going to make all of the difference in the world as to how you face the end road in your life. Now I want to say it again. We push this out of our mind. We try to put it behind us so many times. If Jesus tears his coming, I'm talking reality. There's no escape. There's something about birth in this world. The stats are astonishing. For every person that's, that's, that's born in this world, they die. That's an astonishing stat. You say, well, I knew that we many times don't live like we know it. We act like, we live like, we're going to hang around here, or we're not the one that's next on the list, or uh, we're, we're maybe sometime, but not this time. I was talking to a dear preacher friend of mine this week. He's retired from the ministry. He said to me, he'd been sick himself, his wife's been sick. He said to me, he said, you know, after all of the years, I think he pastored 40-some years, maybe 50 years, almost at the same place. He said to me, he said, you know, I have been to the bedside of people who died who were saved. He said, I, and here's the way he said it, and I love the way he said it. 
He said, those saved people, he said, I knew they loved the Lord. He said, I preached to them. He said, I was there with them, and we worshiped together. We served God together. And he said, I just made up my mind. If I'm present when those dear saints, when they pass on into the presence of the Lord, he said, I just made up my mind. I'm going to get at the head of the line. I want to get my ear over real close. I want to hear what they've got to say. I want to put that in my little uh, mental computer because he said, one day I'm going to be there. And here's what he said. He said, I've heard what a lot of those dear saints had to say when they died and when they went into the presence of the Lord. He said, I want you to know I'm really encouraged. He said, I hear those dear saints of God say something about the beautiful flowers. He said, I hear them say something about the bright light that they're getting, that they're seeing. And he said, I've been in the room with so many of them when they were dying. And he said, I was in the presence of one not that long ago. And they was getting ready to cross over into the presence of the Lord. Uh, and he said, they said to me just before they passed over, they called his name. And they said, look, stand, look right over there. You see him? He's standing right over there. Can you see? him he's standing right over there look at him he said man I wanted to get down close I wanted to hear that and he said I want you to understand I am greatly encouraged by what these dear saints are saying uh, as they're checking out here and checking in over there and the way we check out here will be determined by what we do with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ why? Because just like Rahab, she was in a condemned city. It would soon fall. The walls would fall. And the people there would be killed. Uh, and she recognized uh, she was on the list of destruction. Uh, and she was looking for a way out. And so are we. We're born in this world on the road and the trail of destruction. Uh, but the good news is there's someone that walks down that road. Uh, and he's looking for us. He's coming after us because the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I'm glad he looked me up one day. I'm glad he found me one day. I'm glad he came along one day because it changed my whole life and my whole outlook on living. And thank God gave us hope for eternity. Hallelujah! What a Savior! But then this preacher said this to me. He said, I've also been in the room where that lost person died. And then he gave me an illustration. He said, I was called one day to go into the room. He said, I had a member that had a family member that was lost. And he said, they called me and said, preacher, would you go over there and try to talk to them? He said, I know they're lost. And it's just going to be a matter of time. And the time is very short. The time is passing hurriedly when they're going to be gone. And he said, preacher, that person is lost. Would you go try to win that person to the Lord? He said, I got in my automobile and I ran over, drove over there, ran in the hospital. He said, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. He said, I hadn't experienced anything like it before or after. He said, this was a huge man and said, this man had come down to the end of the journey and he was afraid to die. And said the man had actually gotten out of the bed, almost like he was hallucinating, almost like he's trying to find, grappling for some kind of truth to help him. And the man was down on the floor and said they had four or five orderlies and doctors there around him. And said this man is screaming to the top of his voice. Uh, and said they finally got him up out of the floor and he got him up on the bed. And the man is talking about how he's getting ready to go to hell. He don't want to die and go to hell. He's starting to scream as if he's filling the flames uh, of fire already eating away at his soul as he's yelling and as he's screaming. And they're trying to hold the man down on the bed as he's facing eternity he's seconds away from leaving time and going into eternity and he said I've never experienced anything he said the look on that man's face was as if he see he's looking right into the fires and the flames of hell right now he said the look on his face was as if he already hears the screaming and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth that's taking place in hell right now he said I've never seen anything like it he said 
said, I never want to see anything like that again. And he said, when that man screamed his way out into eternity, he said, the doctor came over and said to me, he said, I've never seen anything like this in all of my life. And he looked at my preacher friend and he said, have you ever seen anything like this? And my preacher friend said, no, and I hope to never see anything like that again. Let me tell you, my friend, hell is as real as this auditorium is real. Heaven is as real as this auditorium is real. And all of us have a destination, and it's heaven or hell. We are bent for destruction when we come into this world, like Rahab was bent for destruction as the city would be destroyed. But thank God in his providence, he makes a means of escape that we don't have to die and go to hell. I'll never forget standing in the hospital room with my wife's dad. It had him on a ventilator for a few days. And some three or four years previous to that occasion, he had to, basically, he'd never gone to church. But when I came and took his daughter away, he decided to start going. And he and his wife, my wife's mother and dad, they started coming in our storefront building years ago. Now, my father-in-law didn't drive. He had a severe asthma. And he was afraid he'd have an asthma attack under the wheel of his automobile so my wife's mother did all the driving. <laughs> I got time to tell you this little tidbit. I got a call one day. Anything happened, she'd call me. She called me on the phone one day and she said, uh, Ron, would you come over to the house? The brakes failed on my car. I said, are you hurt? She said, no, I'm okay, but she said, I ran through the garage. She said, would you come over here and see if we can get the garage propped up, get the garage off the car? I said, I want you to check my brakes to see what's wrong. So I drove up in the driveway, and all I could see was they had an open carport on one end and a wall in the back. She'd gone through everything. And uh, she'd hit everything. It was in. I got to looking when I drove up. You could see where the back tires on that car was just spinning wide open, throwing dirt everywhere. She hadn't hit the brake. She had pressed on the accelerator. And she drove that thing wide open into that garage and through the garage. And until the day she died, she would never admit that she had her foot on the gas. Never. I checked it out. Brake pedal was fine. Brakes was fine. But she got in there, and she just, I guess she seen Roy coming out the door. And she drove through there. I laughed till I hurt. But Brother Tom Rigby, one of our missionaries who's now in heaven also, I took him over to see my father-in-law. I'd witnessed to my father-in-law. My father-in-law had a uh, bad case of self-righteousness. Just believing that I believe I'm okay. I, I, I think everything will be all right. And I took, my, I took Brother Tom Rigby, our missionary, over to see him, and they hit it off. <laughs> I picked Brother Tom up one day at the airport as he was flying in. At that time, I had a car that would talk to you. When you'd get in and sit down, this voice would come through the car, fasten seat belts. It was a lady's voice. And Tom's never been in anything like that. I mean, he, when he flew up in America for the first time, he got up a little distance over Florida, he, living in the islands down in the Caribbean. He said about America, he said, this is the largest island I've ever flown over. And I picked him up at the airport and put him in my car, and we closed the door. And this lady says, 
fasten seat belts. He's looking around. He's looking in the back. He's looking towards me. He said, where is she? I said, Tom, that's an automation thing. He couldn't figure it out. I took him over to my father-in-law's, and I sicked him on him. They sat there in the living room and talked, and there was a comradeship between them that took place that day. And my father-in-law bowed his head in the presence of Brother Tom Rigby, acknowledged to God that like Rahab in the city of Jericho, he was in fact doomed for eternity unless he got saved. And that day in the presence of Brother Tom Rigby, my father-in-law bowed his head and he trusted Christ as his Savior. Just a few years passes by, I'm standing in intensive care over to the hospital. He's been unresponsive now for several days. I'll never forget it, I'm standing at the foot of the bed. And we're standing there, I'm, not, I'm there beside of my wife and some other people. And I just happened to look up at my father-in-law's face. And like flipping a switch... Suddenly, his eyes came open. Hadn't been open for days. Suddenly, I've never seen anything like it. I never noted his eyes being that large before. There was a countenance that came across his face. There was the glow of another world that saturated his countenance. It was as if he was privileged at that moment to look into the face of the Lord Jesus. It was as if at that very moment he was looking into the city to which he was going. And in just a little while, he closed his eyes in death as he transferred from planet earth into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you it makes a difference when you come down on your deathbed and you're looking eternity in the face. It makes a difference how you do with the fact and deal with the fact that like Rahab, we are in a condemned world on our way to a Christless eternity. And what we do with the person of Jesus, the only Savior of the world, will have everything to do with the transition from here into eternity oh thank God that God in his providence fixed a means of salvation for this harlot in the city of Jericho You know something else in closing that I find very interesting about this story? It is simply this. That this little harlot over there in the city of Jericho did not have much light. Spiritual light and spiritual illumination. The only thing she knew about Israel's God was what she had heard probably from some of her customers. As they came into the city, as they came into her home, word is out. The God of Israel is prospering that nation. That everything that's in front of them is falling to them that God the greatness of Israel's God <clears throat> is destroying all of the enemies and tearing down all of the cities that their God opened up the Red Sea she testifies to it in this chapter that their God has done supernatural things for them and the fact that she's heard about the God of Israel has whetted her spiritual appetite has given her a, a desire to know more about him. She didn't have much knowledge. Contrary to that, here's the nation of Israel. 
Here's the nation of Israel that God gave all the promises to and gave all the covenants to and allowed them to escape through the Passover lamb and open up the Red Sea and fed them miraculously and led them for 40 years through the wilderness. Uh, and they've seen the presence of God in the tabernacle and they've watched the pillar of, of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And they've had all types of revelation and the ability to know something about God. And yet they have doubted and they've doubted and they've doubted to the extent that God had to turn them back in the wilderness uh, and destroy them and raise up a new generation. And then they were murmuring and they were grumbling uh, and they were complaining. Uh, and here's a lady that had none of that, but she was willing to take advantage of the little life that she had. And when she took that by faith, God said, I'll take that little amount of faith. I'll forgive you of all of your sins uh, and I'll make sure that you get to glory when all of this is said and done. You don't have to have a Ph.D. behind your name to get saved. You don't have to have uh, the things, uh, the no, no, notoriety and the popularity of this world for Jesus to accept you. You know how you come to him? Charlotte Elliott said it right. Just as I am. Without one plea, but that thou blood was shed for me. You know how God takes you in? Just like you are. You're listening to me today. You say, I've done some atrocious things. and I've got to make some amends. Listen, you don't do anything to get your sins forgiven. As a matter of fact, what you try to do to get your sins forgiven is only more condemnation voiced against you because you're bypassing God's only means of salvation, the sacrifice of Calvary. I want you to know it's not, nothing in our hand we bring. It's simply to the cross we cling. She didn't have a lot of light. She didn't have a lot of illumination. And in the providence of God, he said, I will see that somebody gets in her presence to tell her how she can have her sins forgiven. And thank God, when they got over there and they spoke with her, they made a little covenant because she said, I want my family to go with me. Man, that's a message for another day right there. I hope your family's going with you. I really do. You know what she was concerned about? She was concerned about her household. And in this chapter, she names her family, and she said, when this city is ultimately destroyed, I want to make sure that my family is saved with me. You know what they said to her? This little scarlet rope that you're going to use to let us down to this wall to get out of this city. You hang that rope out there, put it in the window. And when we cross the Jordan and we come over here and this city is destroyed, if you put that rope there in the window, you will be saved and your family can be saved. You know what that scarlet rope is? That scarlet rope represents the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What if she'd said, hey, just any old rope will do. It don't have to be scarlet. What if I want to put a checkerboard rope down there? What if I want to put a blue or a yellow or some other color? Then she would have died. You know what God say? You put the scarlet, you put the red rope there on the wall and in the window. And when we cross over and that scarlet cord is there, that will mean that you will be saved and your household can be saved. You know something today? Thank God those of us that are saved, we got in under the scarlet cord. What is it that gets us in? What is it that gets God's attention? It's the blood of his son. It's the blood of the crucified one. 
Today, there's a downplay on the blood. They make fun of it. They mock it. But the truth is, without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And God is still in the blood business. But I'm glad the business he's in is the blood of his son. And the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to cleanse the sins of this entire world. That's how I got in. That's how you got in. If you're saved today, and it was the blood that got this harlot in, and it was the blood that got her family in, because it was the blood represented by that scarlet cord uh, that kept that portion of the wall from falling down. You know, I read a few years ago, archaeologists went in there and they found the remains of that wall and they found one place on the end of that wall where there was a little household, most of it was still standing. Let's just think for a minute that this organ represents the house she lived in. And everything else up here represents that wall. And she said, I believe God will do what he said he'd do. And she dropped that scarlet cord out that window. And when they marched around that city seven times and they blew that trumpet and they shouted, everything over here started crumbling and falling and decaying. And this little place here, they got her and brought her out and brought her family out. But this little place right here, it stayed basically intact. You know why? Because it was the scarlet cord that brought protection in the time of calamity. And you know what's going to keep us safe into the presence of the Lord? The blood of Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen to me. There's a song out there that says it right. It's still the blood. And it is still the blood. And thank God the blood took care of Rahab. She got in the Hebrews Hall of Fame. And James said in the New Testament, if you want to know something about how uh, faith works, look at Rahab. Uh, because when she got saved in a right relationship with God, her faith kicked in. And she proved to the world she was saved by the works that she did. Now, she didn't prove to God she was saved by her works. She, she trusted in God. Faith in God saved her. But after she got to him, it was the works that proved before the world that she indeed was saved. Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Hear me today. We're in a condemned world. This was a condemned city. Your only hope, the only means, the only means of pillowing your head on your deathbed triumphantly and victoriously is that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And I want to encourage you today, if you don't know him, you ought to come to this altar. You're listening to this radio, uh, this service through the radio station or the internet ministry. You need to call our number. If you realize that you're fast headed towards eternity and you've never been saved, you ought to call our number. We'll be glad to pray with you and tell you how to be saved. If you're in this building and you've never been saved, you need to get around this altar today and ask God to save you. We're, we are headed to the destination of eternity. If you're saved today, if you are saved today, you feel like you're just not where you ought to be spiritually. You're not as close to Jesus as you need to be. You ought to get out from where you stand, get around this altar and say, Lord, help me today to get back where I ought to be, where I need to be, where I should be as one of your children. Lord, bless this invitation in these moments. And we'll love you and thank you for it. Because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. We're singing this stanza. If others need to come, slip out and come right now while we wait. Spirit of God speaking to you. Come on right now as we sing this stanza of invitation. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed. stands up. Anyone else needs to come, would you come? Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul.